Good evening or good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rod Escaola, and I'm a condominium lawyer with uh, Gowling WLG. And welcome to uh, episode five of our uh, webinar series. This week, uh, the episode is uh, named, I guess, Implementing the New Normal, because it seems like we're in this for a little while longer with uh, Ontario having extended by at least 28 days the emergency measures that have been implemented a while back. Now, for those of you joining us for the first time tonight, we've been holding these on a weekly basis. This is week five, obviously, and week after week, what we do, we try to do our very best to provide you real practical uh, answers to ever-changing cha challenges that we never even knew existed. Uh, and, and the agenda keeps changing almost on a daily basis because as we prepare and as we um, gather information, new questions come up. Now, again, this week, we have a, uh, gathered some key industry experts, and you'll recognize some of them. So I'll just go around the table very quickly and test a microphone. So um, Sandy Folds from uh, Wilson Blanchard Management, speaking also on behalf of CCI. Good evening, Sandy. Oh, have we lost her? Graham, are you controlling the muting? I am not, but hold on, let's, let's just see here. See, this is why no, we No, she's do not muted. No, Sandy, are you there? We can, can see her lips moving, but we can't yeah. hear you speaking. So you'll have to play with that. We'll get back to you in a minute. How about you, uh, Catherine? We heard you, Catherine uh, Gell from uh, speaking on behalf of ACMO. Good evening, Catherine. Hello, everyone. Okay, and Denise Lash uh, from the Lash Condo Law and also uh, speaking on behalf of the Community Association Institute, the Canadian chapter. Hello, Denise. Hello, good evening, everyone. Hey, good evening. Uh, Graham McPherson from Gowling WLG. Graham. Hi, everybody. Hello. And uh, David Plotkin also from Ga uh, Gowling WLG there. Good evening, everyone. Hello. So if any one of you is wondering how long we've been locked down and stuck with this, just have a look at David's beard. So this is our way of measuring how <laughs> deep into this crisis we are. Uh, we also have Jason Reed from the National Life Safety Group. Jason, are you there? Good evening, everyone. Hey, good evening, Jason. And finally, and so these ones you've all recognized from last week, but uh, this week we're very lucky to have with us uh, Christian Cadieu, an infection preventionist and environmental epidemiologist. Uh, Christian works with uh, crime scene cleaners. Hello, Christian. How are you? Hello. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So back to uh, Sandy. Do we She's have back. Wonderful. Perfect. Hello. <laughs> so we have a full agenda tonight, as we always do, and hopefully we won't spill over too much into the next hour. Um, and as we have in the past, we've been inundated with hundreds of questions from our viewers, and naturally we won't be able to answer all of your questions. We'll do our best to hit the more recurring questions, keeping in mind that some of your questions have been answered in past episodes, and now we're uploading our episodes on the condoadvisor.ca's website. And so feel free if you wanna see uh, what David's beard looked like last week, or if you wanna <laughs> hear what we spoke about, you can do that. Um, now we've also have a, we have the chat channel. Some of you have discovered it already, uh, and feel free to access it and ask questions and chat amongst yourselves. But uh, do uh, keep in mind that I mean the show is here on your screen because sometimes you're asking questions that we've answered already. Uh, but that's to me I, I love seeing the exchanges we 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 see on the side here. Now, uh, most importantly, and this is the weekly disclaimer. You're used to it by now. Uh, while we do our best to provide you with uh, accurate information, you have to keep the following in mind. Uh, when we refer to legislation, we refer to Ontario legislation. So if you're tuning in from elsewhere, you'll have to adapt what we say to your jurisdiction. Please note also that the information we provide is accurate as of the date of this broadcast. Today is April 14th. And so if you're watching this uh, as a repeat later on, on on our website, you'll have to keep in mind that the information may have changed uh, since then. Also keep in mind that the information we're providing you tonight is general in nature and it doesn't necessarily apply to the very specific of your situation. And so uh, it's important for you to seek professional advice to get information that's applicable to your situation because what we're giving you here is good but not necessarily good for everybody. And finally, I uh, have to advise you that this session is being recorded. And as I said already, we'll upload it on our website, but it takes me about 10 days to figure out how to upload it. So there's no point in writing to me and asking me tomorrow where it is. It's not up there yet. 
one of the reasons why it's taking so long is that we need to transcribe the content of, of our uh, webinars. Okay, let's dive in now. Um, we're going to start by revisiting a question that keeps, uh, oh, and I, somebody has to remind me to change the slides. So these are the speakers, of course, and that's the agenda. Uh, we're going to start uh, today by revisiting a question uh, pertaining to the essential services. And that's a question that keeps recurring. We being, we're flooded with this question, in part perhaps because the definition of essential services keeps changing. But also I would say in part because everybody's trying to find an exception. Everybody's trying to find a reason why their car wash should be open and why their unit should be painted and why you know their gym should be open just for them. I mean, the, the plan behind what we're going through is to try to flatten the curve by getting people to stay home, right? And if everybody's trying to find an exception, it's not working, right? But that's a question that we keep hearing. And um, uh, and I think it's in, this, this recurring question has to do, and I keep saying it, is because Canadians have lost, have forgotten what it is to put uh, collective needs uh, in front of their own desire, right? This is something we haven't done in about 75 years. So we'll have to just try to get used to that. But Graham, I'm gonna turn the microphone to you now. And can you give us maybe a bit of a recap on the essential services and emphasize maybe this time how, did, how it applies to various recurring services or, or, or contractors that corporations need to have on site? Yeah, so, and, and I think by way of backdrop, we need to be careful with the word need. Um, but so what, what the emergency order tells us is that any maintenance, repair, and property manage, ma management services that are strictly necessary to manage and maintain safety, security, and sanitation, and essential operations of the building are essential. In other words, very, very restrictively, what needs to be happening to maintain safety, security, and sanitation? Right, and this is, I think, where uh, the rubber hits the road in the sense that you have to ask yourselves always, is this strictly necessary? And is it essential to the operations of the building? And one of the questions that we've heard a lot this week, Sandy, uh, had to do with landscaping and whether or not landscaping is either strictly necessary or somehow essential to the operations of, of a building. What's, what's your take on that? And I know we've talked about it, but it's worth repeating here. It is. Um, whoever thought landscaping would be such a hot topic. Uh, Landscape Ontario on their website still clearly says, um, states to their members, we recommend you stop working unless you're confident you fit under the updated essential workplace list. Um, the general consensus from all the lawyers involved in today's panel and several other blogs and publicized opinions we've read over the last few days say that landscaping and other aesthetic services are not essential services. Um, the, the key that Graham mentioned in the, in the new government definition is what is strictly necessary to manage them and maintain the safety. Um, so only work that's truly urgent should be undertaken and everything else should be postponed. However, we have many landscapers that are continuing to work in the industry. They say they're doing it carefully and they're exercising social dis distancing. From their point of view, they feel that spring cleanups are being done for the safety of residents and security of the property, which they feel does fall under the definition. Um, for this to be valid, there must be a real risk and the contractor must be able to justify. Oh. Justify or substantiate the reason why it's an essential service. I, I'm just gonna pick up because of course, in preparing for tonight's webinar, we had had some, some conversations previously. And I'm not entirely sure what happened with your audio, Sandy, but. Are you back on, Sandy? I see you. Yeah. Moving. Okay. Yep. Good. Okay. So we just missed the very end, but uh, oh, okay. Catherine caught up. I mean, you guys yep. are like uh, Siamese twins reading <laughs> each other's mind. That's great. Okay. And so some, some of the questions that people are, ask are, are asking, so what about cutting grass, Sandy? Is that essential? Well, cutting grass is not, um, but something like spring cleanups, making sure catch basins are clear, branches and twigs and anything that's dead is removed, um, walkways, paths, so that there's no trip or slip hazards on there. Um, those are essential, but day-to-day -day cutting of your lawn right now, it's not, um, nor is getting your sprinkler system open. 
Right. And that is what took 27 minutes of our time yesterday when we were discussing that. What about that? What about sprinkler systems? And I guess the answer is that it is likely not strictly necessary for security, safety, uh, security, safety, sanitation, or the essential operations of a building. I do yeah. realize that this, this, if this lasts a long time and you don't have your sprinkler system on, well, you know, your grass and flower beds and so on will, will likely not survive. Well, look on the upside, I guess, is that you won't need to cut the grass. So yeah. I'm sorry, but that's sort of yeah. how it is. And I ultimately it is the board members' decisions on how to proceed, but they should involve their solicitors if they're letting their landscapers work on their properties. Right, and so that leads to the next question. I'm gonna turn the question, to the microphone to David. The next question is, well, wait a second. So if I don't get to pay my landscapist, do I, as if he doesn't, he or she doesn't come here to do their work, must I pay them? That's a question we hear a lot. David, what's the answer to that? Yeah, so I, I just want to address very quickly force measure. This word is being thrown around quite a bit because colloquially we all often we talk about, you know, an act of God or force majeure. In, in contract terms, force majeure means something very specific. It mu you must have a force majeure clause in your contract to be able to invoke force majeure. If you do not have a force majeure clause, you cannot invoke uh, either party saying, I don't have to pay or I don't have to do the work. So the first step, you absolutely must look at each contract that you have with each of your contractors individually, review the terms of your force measure clause because they will say vastly different things. You know, a standard force measure clause might say something like, um, uh, the parties agree to provide uh, 14 days notice uh, one to the other in the event of the following events. Things like acts of God, things like civil strife, war, uh, a number of different things. And I, I personally have not seen a force majeure clause that expressly states a, uh, a health pandemic. So a lot of this will be based on interpretation. So it's very important to address, the, uh, especially if there's a lot of money uh, at issue, with, uh, to, do, to address this with counsel to try and figure out what your obligations and rights are. The only way to get out of a contract otherwise is on the back end uh, through what's known as the doctrine of frustration. So this is if you don't have a force majeure clause, but the essential nature of your contract can no longer be fulfilled. It's impossible or illegal to be able to fulfill it. You might have a defense after the fact. So you have to be sued for those amounts. And then you state, you know, I, the, the purpose of the contract was frustrated. Um, it was impossible. I therefore should not be liable. So those are really the only two ways to get out of it. So if someone just comes to you and says, you know, I, I, force majeure, you have to keep paying me, or force majeure, you don't have to pay me, or force majeure, I don't have to do this work, the answer is always you have to look at what your contract says, and your contract may not be explicitly clear, so you, you, you should really be, be sure about what the obligations are before you uh, just agree to uh, the colloquial force majeure that everyone is uh, throwing around these days. Right. So before you cut the check to your landscapist that hasn't shown up, you know, for sure have somebody review your contract and, and, and sort of guide you through that. Um, now let me change, go back to closing of amenities. And, and this keeps coming back up because as I said, I mean, I, I got an email this week saying, can you believe they closed my, my, uh, my, the, the car wash at the condo? What can I do to force them to uh, reopen it? What are your thoughts, they said. My thoughts, two words, world pandemic, buddy. That's, those are my thoughts. I mean, and so let's cover a bit about closing the amenities. Uh, Graham, uh, we have some survey results on this, do we not? Uh, yes, we do, and they're appearing in front of us now. So uh, for the most part, we're seeing that our respondents are closing their amenities. What these results you're seeing here are, are the percent of our respondents who have kept them open. So we're seeing things like, you know, the fitness room, the pools, the party rooms, very low amounts of people, of respondents are keeping this open. The, the items that are tending to remain open, you can kind of see more in the middle. And, and these ones make sense uh, more, than, uh, more than things like pools and fitness rooms in terms of their essential nature, stuff like the garbage chute and visitor parking and, and the garbage rooms, and uh, then to a lesser extent, laundry rooms. Right. You know you're living the life when your amenity is a garbage chute. This is amazing. 
<laughs> with a bonus trip to the laundry room. That's right. Okay, so Catherine, can you uh, give us, uh, remind us of um, maybe municipal guidance on, on these amenities? The City of Toronto has been very clear, and I, I happen to work, of course, in the City of Toronto, so I'm most abreast of what uh, is present there. But the restrictions on gatherings is across Ontario, and so they have sought for all multi-residential dwellings to close all of their amenities, and that includes exterior amenities as well. It's, of course, why you see public parks, schoolyards, all with the equipment um, cordoned off so that folks aren't using it. It is an encouraging additional touches, and it's to help keep sanitary. That's what it's all about. Right. And so I think there's a lot of, uh, and I'm going to turn to you, Jason, because you made a good point yesterday. Um, you need sometimes to explain to your owners why we're closing the amenities. And, and there's maybe two elements to, to that answer. And one of the elements is what we've talked so far, which is the province is telling us to shut down all non-essential services. The gym is not an essential services. The car wash is not an essential services. And for the corporation to continue to provide these services, you're putting yourself at risk. The corporation is at risk uh, of a fine. The directors may be at risk of a fine. And so that's, that's the, the hardest sort of um, answer. Uh, but there's something to be said about educating owners. Jason, do you want to sort of tell us how you'd approach that? Yeah, I think that's one explanation as to why you would close the amenities. I think the other reason, and a justifiable one from a financial aspect, is the amount of cleaning that would be required to maintain those amenities. Uh, it's just not in a budget. and The manpower is not there. For example, most buildings have one cleaner or two cleaners. They work from eight to four or nine to five and they do their, their cleaning. Um, but if the amenities are open, who is going to do that cleaning and how often are they going to do that cleaning? So quite simply from the C-suite, if you were to take it from an organizational perspective, we can't afford to keep those amenities open because of the manpower and the cleaning requirements would be too significantly um, harsh. You'd have to maintain those. Right, 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 right. Okay, so that's for uh, essential services. Let's park that for a second and let's go on another topic that we've brushed upon, but we, I want to drill down on it and it's owners meetings. This is probably the second most common question we hear uh, uh, about AGMs. You know, can we, um, uh, can we delay the AGM? For how long can we delay the AGMs or the owners' meetings? And, and, and what would happen if, for instance, um, my term was to expire, my director's term was to expire this AGM, can I now just continue to act as a director until we hold our AGM, whenever that's going to be? So I think part of the problem with this, or part of the confusion is this, is that the province has not suspended the requirement to hold uh, condo AGMs. And that's a bit odd and a bit unfortunate because they have suspended the requirement to hold AGMs for not-for-profits. They have done that. It's probably been 15 to 20 days already, but they haven't adapted that requirement or that suspension to the condo world. And so on the one hand, we don't have clear guidance that these meetings ought to be suspended. But at the same time, we have this very clear prohibition against meetings of more than five people. And so unless your condo corp has five people or less, well, that's a problem. You can't possibly be holding your AGM or your owner's meeting the way we used to while maintaining social distancing. So that's the issue. Now, I'm going to answer some questions rapidly, but then I'm going to turn to Denise and we're going to do the 101 or maybe the 202 on owner's meetings uh, tonight and, and just get that done with and move on. Um, so in quick answers to questions, absolutely, condos can postpone their AGMs and you can postpone them past that six month period. So normally you have to hold your AGM within six months of the end of your fiscal year, right? Well, obviously you can't do this now. And so you can postpone the AGM past that six month period. And while you'll be technically in breach of the Condominium Act, uh, the reality is that there is a superseding order, which is the, uh, the various orders and councils that have been adopted by the province preventing you from holding them at least the traditional way. Now, the second question we have is uh, for how long will these AGMs be uh, delayed? And I think at the very least for as long as these orders and councils remain. Um, and, and to me, that's maybe the foreseeable future. I know that the, um, Ontario has just extended by 28 days these emergency measures. So we're in this for the long run. That leaves us with two questions. Um, what about meetings that cannot wait? 
and um, can we hold virtual or online AGMs? And if so, how it's done? I know that recently the CAO posted on their website some information about how to hold these meetings virtually and online and what are the requirements. But I want to put some meat around that bone with, uh, with, uh, with Denise, if at all possible tonight. So what would be the meetings that couldn't wait? I, I can't think of many. Uh, I think if the board loses quorum, that may be a meeting that can't wait. I think if you want to adopt a bylaw to allow you to hold electronic meeting, meetings and to vote electronically, that's probably a meeting that can't really wait, right? And arguably maybe the turnover meeting. And even that, I'm not sure how urgent that, that turnover meeting uh, does become, does that uh, is. So let's deal with, now that we know we can't have the traditional meeting, uh, Denise from Lash Condo Law, now that we know we can't have these traditional meetings, uh, what are the other alternatives out there? And so maybe start by giving us a bit of the background on the traditional meetings, and then we'll move on to the other kind of meetings. Okay, thanks, Rod. I think I'll do the traditional, and then you'll go on to the proxy-only meeting, and then I'll okay. continue on with the online. Sure. Um, so let's look at what we've been doing uh, prior to the pandemic. Uh, we all know that you can attend a meeting and vote in person by a paper ballot. And then of course we have the proxy method, which could be either a directed voted proxy uh, or a proxy that gives the proxy holder the right to vote for them. With proxies, the proxy holder has to show up to the meeting. So we have in person or showing up to the meeting. As of November, 2017, there are some condominium corporations that have been doing electronic voting and they've been doing that because they passed the electronic voting bylaw, which we'll discuss shortly. And then since also since November, 2017, and this is one where probably not a lot of people know about this, but you could pass a bylaw to allow absentee ballots, mail-in ballots. So that's something that uh, we have not seen yet, but it's in the legislation and it can be done. Your turn now, Rod. Okay, thank you so much. So that's the traditional meetings and you see, as, as Denise just indicated, there's quite a few alternatives and variations and options and we'll speak about them a bit more in a minute. What I refer to as meeting by proxies only is this. If you must hold a meeting, for instance, if you've lost quorum, and Graham will talk about that later, but if you must hold a meeting, one of the options for you is to hold a meeting by proxy only. So you could envision this. You could envision a situation where uh, the, the president could be the chairperson. You'd call a meeting uh, to be held at his unit, but nobody shows up, right? And people are able to send in their proxies. You, you need to be very clear on how these proxies will be filled, but if you have a one, item agenda. We want to vote on adopting a bylaw to permit electronic voting, for instance. Well, if, you're, if your note to the owners is very clear that that's what you're going to be doing, you could do it in such a way where all the proxies are being sent to the chairperson. The chairperson is in his or her unit. He or she gathers all the proxies. You count the proxies and then that's it. You just had your meeting. Your meeting was held by proxy only. And again, it may require a lot of work with, with the owners. You, you need to explain what is it we're doing and so on. But it, that is a possible way of holding a meeting. And so nobody came within two meters of the chairperson and you can have that meeting that way. Now, if you wanna add an extra layer of transparency or entertainment, you could have, you could uh, streamline your, you, you could um, uh, stream on the web, the meeting, but that's not the meeting itself. The meeting is held by proxies and people are just able to see what the president's kitchen table looks like and he can, he or she can explain, you know, and count the, pro the ballots and so on and so forth. So that would be what I would call a meeting by proxy only. I guess a third option, Denise, would be the online meetings. And I, there's a lot of um, confusion surrounding that. And there's a lot of questions as to how that's done. Can you walk us through that maybe? Sure, I've, I've been getting a lot of questions almost on a daily basis about this. And, and the confusion is um, online meetings versus electronic voting. And so this has all been very interesting because I think a lot of us are now really looking at the regulations and the Condominium Act to see what we can do to make things 
safer for residents and how can condominium corporations do things virtually. Uh, online owners meetings are not specifically provided for in the Condominium Act, similar to directors meetings. So we don't have a provision dealing with the ability to have an online meeting. We have electronic voting, but not online meetings. However, uh, in the Condominium Act, there is a provision that says that you can pass a bylaw for electronic voting, which we know. Uh, you could pass a bylaw to do mail-in ballots, but you can also pass a, a bylaw governing electronic attendance. And I think this is where we are trying to extend what electronic attendance means to say that that will give a corporation the authority, if they put it in a bylaw, to have electronic attendance being considered an online meeting. And so what we are recommending at this point is if you can get a bylaw passed in the method that you were saying, Rod, you know, do it through the proxy method, then you could get a bylaw that allows electronic voting, um, online attendance, um, which referring to it as electronic attendance, which will be the online meeting, and mail-in ballots. So proceeding by a bylaw to incorporate those three elements. Right, and so the bylaw that you need, if I understand you correctly, Denise, is you for sure need to have in your bylaw at the very least two elements. One of them is the element allowing for the meeting to take place virtually, allowing it for people not to have to show up physically. And that's separate and apart from having, to, uh, having the element that deals with electronic voting. You need both of these, right? Yes, yeah, so exactly. So a virtual attendance meeting is similar to what we're doing tonight. Um, and see, so you have, um, I don't know if you have a show of hands on this feature here, but that is not voting. Voting can only be done by a, a third party provider, somebody different, uh, electronic voting provider uh, that deals with the actual vote. And having a vote done by webinar here, so if everybody uh, puts up their hands, that is not a proper vote. Right, and just as you said that, we saw all sorts of people raising their hands, in, including Greg, and now there's four and five, and there it is, wildfire, fire. there it is. Good, uh, so can you walk us through though, how to adopt a, an electronic, what I call an electronic bylaw, which is basically a bylaw that will allow you to have a, a, a remote uh, meeting and that will allow you to vote. Because I mean, obviously we can't meet, so how would we do it? How would okay, we I'll, tell you, I'll it? take you step by step. Um, so uh, first of all, um, if you're gonna do an electronic voting bylaw, and this has all changed because we never thought of this before, you wanna put all components in there, even if you don't, think you want a mail-in ballot or you don't want an online meeting, I would suggest just putting it all in there. You don't have to use it. Um, just make sure your bylaw is drafted with those three components. Mm -hmm. Then what you would do is just like you were talking about the proxy meeting, you call a physical meeting at a place where the chair is located and you advise the owners, of course, not to attend the meeting um, for the reasons that you just stated previously. Uh, unit owners then will send in their directed proxies to the chair. And of course, the proxy holder has to be the chair for now because we don't have an online meeting yet until the bylaws pass. And so the chair will hold all the proxies. Uh, and then I just also want to mention there are some corporations that have already passed an electronic voting bylaw and now they want to do electronic meetings. So they're gonna go through this process too. So besides giving the chair all the proxies, owners can vote electronically if they already have an electronic voting bylaw, they're now gonna vote for another bylaw to allow online meetings. Mm -hmm. um, I hope everyone's following that because it's a bit complicated. Uh, then, um, the, the chair will conduct the meeting and vote, and hopefully you'll get the required vote. Now, to pass this type of bylaw is one of the easy to pass bylaws. It, as long as you have 25% quorum, and that would be based on the proxies you have or the electronic votes, then all you need is a majority at the meeting to vote for 
that bylaw. So it's not a majority of all the units, it's a majority of those that um, are present at the meeting, present being either electronic votes or a proxy. Uh, the owners can view this. So when we discussed before, Rod, when you're talking about uh, the proxy method of calling a meeting, owners can still tune in and watch via webinar, but that is not an official meeting, not until you pass this bylaw. So of course, owners can view. Um, I wouldn't take owners' comments and, and include it in 80 minutes because it's not an official meeting until you pass the bylaw and allowed to do online meetings. The other point I wanted to raise is nowhere in the Condominium Act does it say that you have to appoint scrutineers because people have asked that question, how can a chair being the one person that has all the proxies and possibly um, you know, the electronic votes and doing the entire meeting, how can they run the meeting? Well, the Condominium Act doesn't say that you need a scrutineer, so the chair will act as a scrutineer and review the proxies, make sure they're valid, um, look at the electronic voting report if there is electronic votes for that, and then report and minutes will be taken of that meeting. Right. And so some of the questions we hear, uh, uh, and I see it online again, you know, what about people that do want to show up at the meeting and how do you deal with that? And what about, and, and, and I think it's a myth, by the way, but what about, you know, uh, senior citizens who, uh, who are less, uh, less uh, versed in technology? And I do say it's a myth because I would uh, suggest to you that um, a lot of them are better at it than I am. And there's a lot of people that do their online banking and we're, it, we're not in the, in the, you know, in the, in the 80s anymore, I think. And so I think the answer to that is you really need to, so twofold. The first question is, how do you deal with people that want to show up at the meeting? Well, you need to properly inform as part of your meeting package, you need to advise the ownership. This is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. And this is how we're doing. The purpose of this meeting will be to adopt a bylaw that will allow us to hold these remote meetings that will allow us to have these votes electronically and you can't show up and this is how we're going to do it, right? And by adding the, the stream uh, and by allowing people to see it online, it sort of maybe reassures them. And as for those that either don't have a computer or are, don't want to uh, do it uh, remotely, they can always go back to the mail-in ballots and you can always go back, I think, to the, to the proxies. Would you agree with that, Denise? Yeah, I would. But also there's a telephone option. So people can phone in and listen. And I think most people have phones. I would hope they would. Right. Um, so at least they can listen. Right. And then they, they have the option of mailing in a ballot if you do the mail-in ballot or a proxy. Okay. So I hope that sort of answered uh, many of the questions we were getting so far. You really were, uh, Denise, very clear, I think, about the step-by-step. -step. If you follow this process step-by-step, -step, you can go from not having the required bylaw to now having it, and to do so uh, safely and in full compliance with the, uh, with the um, orders in council. So let's apply this now to a real fact situation. Let's move on to the, the other question. Those kinds of meetings that can't wait. And one of the meetings I've identified was what do you do when you lose quorum? And so first let's deal with um, the first question, which is uh, whether or not, uh, let me just see here. I'll get to you in a minute, uh, Graham. So the first question would be this. Keep in mind that the fact you've postponed the AGM um, has no impact on, on, on a term that would otherwise expire. So if my term as a director was to expire at this AGM, and this AGM was supposed to be last week, I can continue to act as a director until the next AGM, until the election. That's already provided for in the act, and it's usually provided for in most of the operating bylaws. I mean, you, you certainly want to have a look at that to make sure that it is the case, that your bylaw somehow doesn't state otherwise. And I'll tell you what we've done in certain cases. We've written to the owners, we've told them, listen, for these following reasons, we can't hold the AGM, it's being postponed. We don't know to when, but we will keep an eye on things and we'll keep you appraised and informed of when this will take place. And then this is what we add. We sort of say, by the way, Andrew's term was said to be expired. We've asked Andrew to continue if you would continue to act as a director until the next AGM, he's kindly accepted that. And sometimes what I do is I say, listen, if, if if the majority of you are uncomfortable with that situation, we'll just ask Andrew to step down 
uh, and and but we felt that it was better to have five people on the board rather than four people on the board, right? And so you can sort of um, that way you, you can show your ownership that this is not about Andrew hogging the power and wanting to stay on the chair, right? It's, it's not this not what's taking place. But we have more people around the table that help us navigate through this difficult time. So that's how we've done it in the past. Um, Graham, I'm going to turn to you now, and I'm going to ask you how how do you deal with um, vacancies on the board? I mean, Andrew may not want to stay on the board, right? So how do you deal with vacancies on the board? Yeah, and, and so in that scenario, if, if for example, it's a board of five and they've lost one and Andrew no longer wants the position, the board can appoint someone to, to replace Andrew until the next AGM takes place. And, um, and it's as simple as that, if they've kept quorum. Where we run into more trouble, though, is where, for whatever reason, directors step down or are unable to fulfill their duties anymore, and the board loses quorum. And uh, th this is something that needs to be addressed quickly for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, because the Condominium Act tells us that a meeting has to be held to fill that position within 30 days of having lost quorum. And uh, it's important for reason number two, because the board, when it doesn't have quorum, can't uh, can't act can't take care of the condominium or the common elements or or do anything so it needs to get moving fast and so when the board loses quorum the first thing that has to go out is an icu uh the information certificate update and that has to go out within five days to the owners and this icu will tell all of the recipients that they have five days to announce that they would like to run for the open position or positions um then 15 days before the meeting takes place, the general notice has to go out. This is a situation that's different from normal meetings where ordinarily we send out the preliminary notice uh, 35 days in advance and then the general notice 15 days in advance. When we're dealing with a situation where the board loses quorum, the, the ICU sort of replaces the preliminary notice. And so when this general notice goes out, it will, it will likely, I mean, in our view, a, a sensible way to do it will to have it contain very regimented proxies that are almost entirely already filled out that will you know, name the chair of the meeting and, and say when it's taking place. And it will just leave open to the owners uh, who they want to vote for to, uh, to replace the missing positions. And uh, like, has, like what's been said before, depending uh, how you wanna do this, if you don't have an electronic bylaw, you can do it um, through an in proxy only meeting where the chair or who, where the chair would act as the scrutineer and uh, they could stream it so that people could watch if they want. And, uh, and, and like has already been said, the, any issues with, well, that's a little sketchy, it's weird having this meeting take place alone in a room with one person, the proxies need to be kept for 90 days in any event. And, right. um, and, and likewise, if you do have uh, the electronic bylaw in place that has all the right uh, bells and whistles, then you could hold this meeting totally virtually. Right. And so I guess the lessons I take from this is that you have to act quickly. So if you yeah. do quorum, and by that as an example, if you have five people on your board and somehow you, you fall below three, uh, then you've lost quorum. So you have five days to send out the ICU. That ICU invites people to give their name if they want to run. And you know, like me, that people push at the door. Everybody wants to be on the board. I guess like the, the fame and the fortune that comes with it. And so you have five days to send out the ICU. Then they have five days to tell you they want to run. And then when you send out the general notice, all that information is there and people get to vote for whoever they want, for Denise or David or, or, or Jason, right? And so that's how you fill these uh, vacancies. Okay, wonderful. Um, let's switch topics now and let's talk about um, how to deal with liens and arrears and, 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 and people falling uh, behind and paying their condo fees. And this is now sort of slowly but surely uh, happening now, right? And maybe not, we're still, it's just still early in the game. I mean, it's the first month, it's been 13 days since the, you know, so I'm not sure how many people actually skip April, but sooner rather than later, people are going to have, are going to be facing difficulties in paying their, their common expenses. So maybe, uh, Graham, did you have some stats on this from our survey? Yeah, we do. And uh, there's the slide on it right there. So uh, we gave our respondents the option of three, three choices of how they could respond to this question of how are they going to deal with arrears this month and going forward, at least as long as this uh, pandemic continues. And, and the Potential options are, if required, 
condos will register a lien. And that's that seems to be the mid-range of popularity. Uh, the other option was we don't intend on registering any liens and we want to work with owners. And the response on this showed that uh, it was of limited popularity. And, and we tend to think that that is uh, that's safe and that makes sense to, to regard this uh, second option with suspicion. And then the, uh, the most popular response was, uh, frankly, we don't know yet. And we're going to have to wait and see how this shakes out. Right, right. And so uh, on the grounds, uh, Sandy, in the trenches, are you being, uh, are you seeing a lot of uh, re- people falling in arrears as a result of this, not your regular sort of uh, frequent flyers, but are you seeing a lot of an increase in people being unable to pay their, um, their fees? Well, the good news so far is that we're just experiencing slightly higher than normal amount of return payments for the April 1st uh, common element fees, which is great. That will probably change, but um, you know, we all sympathize with owners' difficulties. Um, but condo owners do have other avenues to turn to for financial assistance. Uh, the Condo Act just doesn't give us that uh, an option right now. Someone has to pay the condo's necessary expenses during this crisis, and in condo land, that someone only is the owners. Right. So I think uh, the lessons to take away, folks at home, is the uh, the lien process has not changed. Uh, And our recommendation, and that seems to be pretty consistent uh, across the board, is you have to lean if you get before the third month default. You have to lean to protect the corporation's ability to recover later. Because if someone is three months behind, uh, the situation is not going to get better. Their credit cards are going to be maxed out. They're, they, you know, they're have they're going to have problems with their mortgage, and so the purpose of the registration of a lien is to allow you to protect your ability to recover the arrears. With a lien that's properly registered in time, you trump even a mortgage on on title. So you got to do that. Now, once you've put the lien on, if you want to sort of you know, ease off on the on the gas pedal and, and not rush to sell the unit or the power of sale. That that's a different story. But you at least gotta put your foot in the door. You gotta put you, you gotta protect your ability to collect. Okay, so that's enough for that. I know that for some, it may be a bit of repetition from last week, but we're just answering questions that we're getting. Um, now, next topic, this is a good one. How do we screen contractors? And so contractors get on site, they come and they do some essential work. How do we ensure that they're not bringing uh, the virus with them? How do we ensure we don't put the community at risk? Um, Catherine, do you wanna tackle this one? Part of the the reason why this comes up is because we have obligations uh, in a workplace setting to ensure that um, folks aren't presented with hazards that are untoward and that you're also controlling for some of those risks. Uh, A number of companies have already circulated to the property managers and they have vetted their pandemic plans. I think one of the things that it behooves property managers to do or and site staff to do is to ensure that folks are reminded and fairly repeatedly on uh, what the guidance is from public health on uh, going to, to different physical locations and to ensure that folks are well and that they are staying home if they are not well. So that can serve as a very important reminder. Uh, that kind of screening also serves to document uh, when you first became aware of certain circumstances and if there was, uh, as I think Christian and Jason, We'll discuss in greater detail in future uh, what, if any, actions need to be taken in order to preserve uh, the workplace setting and to make sure that everybody is safe. Okay. Uh, And Jason, were you, um, I think yesterday you were talking about uh, approaching it maybe at the, uh, and maybe I missed that, Catherine. Did you talk about the kind of screening that you do on a regular basis? Did I just miss that? Yeah, I did. And I made mention of the fact the individual service provider as well as the company. And, right, okay. you know, I think that both of those factors are, are important. Um, I have seen a little bit of pushback from, from some of the unionized elevator firms, for instance. But at the end of the day, um, we are in new, unusual um, circumstances. And, and what is best all the way around always is good communications, open dialogue, um, and, and trying to uh, make sure that folks are reminded on a constant basis of, of how they can protect each other, I think is important. Sure. And Jason, yesterday during our prep talk, you were talking about approaching it maybe at a more systematic level or something that would allow you to capture more of that information. Did you want to add anything to what Catherine just uh, spoke about? Yeah, 
Absolutely. I think that it, quite simply at, at, a, at a leadership level, I think, you know, you have some national contracts so if, uh, you know, or provincial contracts. If I have some contracts with some service providers, um, I should have a long time ago sent some communications and m- given them direction on the new procedures at our building, meaning uh, restricting when and uh, how people can access the building, reminding them on social distancing and letting them know that uh, some buildings have moved down to one entrance and eliminated the second entrance. And contractors need to know that, service providers need to know that. And the reason they're doing it is because they can focus their cleaning abilities on one entrance instead of segregating that. So contractors and service providers need to know that at the leadership level. And you can disseminate that to the president or vice president of your service companies and ensure that gets filtered down and uh, ensure that all the people coming to your building have been notified. Right, okay. Very good. So that's it for contractors. We're going to switch uh, switch topics again, and we're going to talk about visitors. That's another topic that keeps coming back up, and whether or not we can prevent visitors, and whether or not we can prevent tenants from, and whether or not we can prevent move-ins, and so on and so forth. And and um, and this, I think, a part of the confusion is this: is that people at home they're looking at how businesses are handling it, and how stores or companies or federal buildings are are clamping down on this kind of unnecessary traffic. But as we've said in the past, you have to keep in mind that condo corps are people's homes. Uh, And so you can't really tackle it the same way. And so as we've done for the last few topics, let's start with some uh, stats, uh, Graham, about how people will deal with visitors. Did you have a chance to put together a slide on this? Oh, there it is. Sure did. So, uh... What we're seeing for the most part, by and far the most popular response is that uh, while not outright banning people, because again, we've kind of taken the position over and over that that you can't really do that, um, that most condominiums are encouraging owners not to have visitors, but have not prohibited visitors all out. Um, The some condominiums, 13% of them, and and by some, I I do mean with respect only to our respondents, have... uh, reportedly banned all non-essential visits, and 14% of our respondents are just continuing on normally. Right, and less than two have actually banned all visitors, apparently. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, so, and this is just, um, you know, indicative to some extent. This is the survey we send all of you folks at home when you register for the for, for these webinars. We often say, well, give us some information. We want to get a sense of where, where you stand on these things. And those are the results of that uh, survey. But uh, Catherine, what do you see on the grounds? The reality of it is, is, is that every public health outlet has told us not to visit. And I want to be very specific when I use that word, because there's also a difference when folks are accepting people who are providing essential services, who are dropping off, you know, goods to family members who are uh, self-isolating, those who are going to, you know, provide sanitation, cleaning apartments and things of that nature. Uh, And I'm concerned if you were to say, you know, no, absolutely, only residents are allowed here. Um, I think David will support the fact we discussed it uh, a couple of weeks ago now that you're potentially opening yourself up to a human rights complaint. So we have to be very conscientious of some of our competing obligations here. No visiting, but um, you know, essential services need to be delivered to people in their homes. Okay. Okay. Very, very well. Uh, Jason, yesterday you were talking about um, maybe the kinder softer approach to try to dissuade people from visiting and what what, what kind of um, uh, tricks or suggestions do you have for our uh, viewers? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's, a, it, I coined it as a trick, but I think having that transparency and accountability and that exposure throughout the building. For example, one of the things that we've recommended is having a notification at the door that says, you know, where and when you can enter and, and what kind of circumstances the building is going through. Um, and I would put that notification on every floor. Um, for the simple example is when I go from my suite to the elevator lobby, I'm going to see a notice that says, as a reminder, please note that the cleaning of these elevator buttons on the 44 floors of my condo are only done twice a day. And they're only done twice a day within the period of an eight to four shift. So that means nobody's cleaning it after 4 p.m. Now, I don't know if every condo has that general practice for cleaning, but that's what I've come to understand. 
And I think when I read that notice in the lobby, I tend to uh, discourage uh, visitors from coming to see me. Um, and I understand that, that the building's being transparent and making, allowing me to make my own decision based on those facts. And they're very clear. Um, and I think a lot of condo people are going to be uh, surprised to see that that cleaning is only happening twice. Um, if you want to pay for another cleaner to wipe down every elevator station on 44 floors or 22 floors, then go for it. I mean, I encourage it, but I don't know if that's being done. So I think we need to talk about that or at least let the visitors know and allow them to make that decision. So by providing more information to the owners where they see the actual limitations of our resources, uh, they may themselves uh, sort of dissuade their own visitors. Uh, and, but also you were talking about uh, the, uh, the British Columbia, uh, British Columbia survey or, or how, how would you uh, approach that? Do you know what I'm, do you remember what I'm talking about? I do. It was a tactic deployed in British Columbia where the RCMP teamed up with a community association or a nonprofit community group and they established a checkpoint. And the checkpoint was not to uh, take a hard and fast approach on restricting travel, but it was more of a welcoming approach where they explained the risks explained what was going on in the community, explained the benefits that they can apply by turning around. And what they found was that the majority of people who were visitors simply turned around. Right, right. And the same approach has been taken here in Ottawa, uh, the, the bridges between Ottawa and Quebec, uh, and basically they have a police checkpoint and they're not really preventing you from crossing. For One of the reasons for is that they can't. Uh, uh, movement under the charter. Every Canadian has the freedom of movement. But so what they do is they ask you questions and they make you realize that, you know, going uh, to the Quebec side uh, to, to uh, what, for whatever reason, to go visit your cottage may not be required at this stage. And, and they make you think about it, right? Uh, Denise, one last, top, one last point maybe on visitors. Um, can corporations, what's your view? Can corporations actually all out ban all visitors? Yeah, I think uh, my position hasn't changed since last week, and I think I spoke to this last week, um, that until we see a directive from the government that, they, that visitors should be banned from buildings, then my position is there's no legal basis to doing so. And, you know, Catherine made a good point about human rights issues, but there's also potential exposure to liability. If you're screening, well, let's say you screen someone and then you shouldn't have let them in and you did, then there's potential liability. Why get into that and why adopt another role? Right, 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 right. Okay, next topic. And this is an incredible topic, actually. Um, and uh, we're very lucky to have uh, Christian Cazieu with us. Um, he is going to help us sort of have a look at, and hopefully this is not going to happen very often, but I mean, the question that we were posed was, how do you deal with a COVID-related death in, in a unit? And, and whether or not there are some, you handle it differently than any other death in a unit. And the way we've sort of approached it uh, when we're discussing this yesterday, I guess there's, there's two elements to dealing with a fatality in, in a condo corp. And there's an element that's the softer element, which is a public relation challenge maybe, how to manage the community. Uh, and the, the example we were using is that if they see that you know, there's a fire truck or there's a police or there's a coroner's office with their vehicle parked right outside the main door for five hours, I mean, people are gonna get all concerned, right? So there's the PR element and that I'm gonna turn to, is it Catherine, I think that's gonna handle it. Sandy. Sandy, okay. <laughs> yep. uh, uh, but there's also another element, the hard element, which is, well, uh, any precautions are required to be taken to ensure the safety and security uh, flowing from this. I mean, so you have someone who passed away from a disease that is known to be infectious, and how do we deal with that? So let's start maybe, Sandy, with the PR element. What kind of information you feel should be shared and, and to what extent, and sure. how do you tackle that? Sure. So condo corps, are, they're not obligated to communicate deaths for any reason, including COVID-19 to the residents. Managers and boards need to be very sensitive to and respect the family's wishes at all times uh, in these cases. 
However, to reassure residents that there's no public safety hazard, it can be communicated that the corporation has responded appropriately to a situation which occurred. They can state there was a medical emergency in the building, that the authorities and professionals were brought in to deal with the situation appropriately, and all precautions were taken as required to deal with the emergency and any sanitation procedures needed are being undertaken. When in doubt and due to sensitivity of this topic, involve your lawyers again. Okay, so that's how you sort of manage the situation so the rumor mill doesn't go not uh, go crazy and so people are sort of reassured that you're not at risk. We, we did what we had to do. So now I'm going to turn the, f the floor to uh, Christian Kazir and, and um, help us maybe understand how a COVID death in a unit may require additional or different sort of precautions or, or a different protocol and maybe divide this in within unit and outside of the unit. Okay, those are great questions. Well, thank you very much for having me as your guest today. What I can tell you is essentially with respect to concentrating on the unit first, everything inside the unit should for all intents purposes be deemed as it is in fact contaminated with COVID-19. And it would fall along the same principle as uh, something which is known as universal precautions in the United States or here in Canada, let alone Ontario, universal blood and bodily fluid precautions, assuming that all biohazardous materials are in fact positive for a bloodborne pathogen. Now, if we take this concept and we apply it to inside a unit, assuming that everything in that unit is in fact, all surfaces, I mean, ceilings, walls, floors, contents, are in fact contaminated with COVID-19, it would be important, as well as the floor, of course, uh, it would be imperative to disperse a particular product, an agent, to decontaminate uh, all these uh, surfaces prior to commencing work. Under normal circumstances, uh, before the COVID-19 situation, that was not an actual protocol that we enforced internally when commencing any type of remedial or decontamination work. We would deal with the primary issue of contamination and any odor that may have distributed itself or found its way throughout the, the environment. So it's certainly it would be in everyone's best interest to take every precaution reasonably necessary and of course decontaminate all surfaces within the environment and, and furthermore there's other matters that a lot of people or a lot of us for example may not take into consideration ultimately no one will find out if in fact the deceased died from covid uh, until a death certificate is issued that may be a few days. So it would be in the best interest of everyone to quarantine that unit and ensure that nothing comes out of that unit, whether it's pets. And again, I, I wanna be very careful how I say here and very sensitive. There are situations uh, right now, we don't know as the science on this, particular, uh, on this particular virus is changing, not just every day, but every hour. Now, we don't know if, what, if the spread from a surface going into the common area from infestation or perhaps from a pet in the environment can in fact spread that. It's something that we need to take into consideration and factor the worst case scenario, that everything that is in that unit should stay in that unit for as long as possible until the necessary contractor has been vetted and is used in order to decontaminate, disinfect, sanitize all surfaces and contents within. Now, as we were speaking before, now you have the other issue. You have a common area. So you have your first responders, fire, EMS, police, uh, coroner's office, body removal company. They usually rec uh, represent the coroner's office, the body removal people. But they will be in the hallway with perhaps a stretcher, and then they will go into the environment to recover the corpse into a body bag, uh, and then they would have to perform some level of minimizing the cross-contamination factor, whether it's leaving their booties inside the unit and then coming out with a fresh pair of booties or uh, something else, and then putting the, uh, the corpse on a stretcher and then moving the stretcher down, which then opens up the door to another situation. What is the level of responsibility from the condominium corporation in the common area? Do you have someone 
who is shadowing the first responders to everywhere where they have stepped for anyone who has been inside that unit and on the common area until that common area is treated. What do you do with the individuals who live on that floor? For example, somebody wants to take garbage to the garbage chute on that floor or leave for whatever reason. What can you do? What you have someone that's coming into the common area, walking on the common area, possibly there's a cross contamination factor. That cross contamination factor may not, might now enter into their unit. So, what type of measures are responsible or certainly in the best interest of everyone to, uh, to adhere to? And again, these are, uh, these are questions that are very difficult to answer as the science is continuously changing. So, it's um, there's um, it, it's a big, it's a loaded question on what needs to be done and what can be done, of course, within the realm of reason. Right, right, right. And and at the end of the day, uh, you you can't make it entirely safe. I mean, it's it, there's a continuum from doing nothing, which is bad, to you know doing absolutely everything, and maybe to an extent that's actually impossible. There's always going to be risks that. That linger behind. The question is, what can you do to minimize that? Is that sort of how you approach it? Absolutely, because this breaks down to uh, due diligence, but even more so than that, uh, you have a cross contamination, and it's it's impossible to eliminate cross con to remove cross contamination or eliminate cross contamination. What we do is essentially we work in degrees and percentages in minimizing the cross contamination factor as best as we possibly can. If you were going to quarantine the unit, I would certainly, something as simple as duct taping the door to the frame of the outside of the hallway, make sure or ensure that no, and again, forgive me, I don't want to be graphic here, but any type of infestation may find its way out through underneath the door or something as simple as that. Because again, we don't know the science on this and what type of contamination may spread into common areas. Is it a fly? Is it an insect? I mean, Entomology reports and studies have yet to be disclosed on what is possible, not possible. Sure, I might be stretching here, but that's the industry that we're in. And this is what we're trying to do is we're trying to factor in the worst case situation and address it as best as we possibly can. Right, right. Keeping in mind that this is evolving and, and we're learning. There's new studies almost every day about... And, and even when you listen to what they say uh, in the various report we get, you know, is, is it airborne? It's not airborne. It's, is a mask okay? Is a mask required? Sure. Is, is it, so. There's a question here that somebody said that corpses aren't breathing, sneezing, or coughing. And uh, Joan Juffs, John Juffs, whoever said that, uh, I can tell you that you're absolutely right. However, this morning, the first recorded case in Thailand of an individual contracting COVID-19 from a corpse is now documented. So what does that tell you? what does that tell you the science is changing right right we're getting we're learning as we go here okay well very good uh can't thank you enough for this uh, uh christian uh, Cazieux. um thank you very much he's with the, the crime scene cleaners and uh hopefully don't take offense to that but hopefully I, i'm not going to see you in my building <laughs> You never want to see me professional. <laughs> That's right. Thanks so much. This is very, uh, very useful. Now, we get to the next uh, topic. And I regret that we always keep this for the end. The safety and security, security element is always kept for the end of the presentation. And by the time we get there, we're all exhausted. And it seems like it's almost as if we're sort of tripping ourselves over governance matter, forgetting for a second that this crisis is mainly about safety and security and health. And, and it's a bit odd that it almost comes as an afterthought, but um, uh, Jason, I had promised you a good segment and you were kind enough to provide us with a good segment. So here it is. I want to talk about um, the various sort of, um, let, let's first start maybe about risk management. And let's talk about, you know, when routine risk management is really not routine anymore. Well, help us out here. So COVID-19 makes risk management really non-routine, and, and it's not because I think we've shifted operations. We've, we've done so many changes in our operations. We've reduced um, uh, tasks. We've added tasks. So it's a really great time to kind of sit down 
and have a look at the different emergencies that happen within your building. Um, property managers and building staff have long been experts at this. They, they manage and put out the proverbial fires on a daily basis. But right now, let's take a look at fire. Right now, you have an increased risk of fire in, your, in, in most high-rise buildings, in condominiums. And why do you have that? You have an, a full populated building 24 hours a day. You have a full populated building cooking three times a day, whereas four weeks ago, they weren't cooking three times a day. Um, in addition, you have the new procedures now for fire alarms and evacuations to add social distancing within those fire alarms and emergency procedures. That social distancing includes within the hallways, it includes within the stairwells, and it includes once you get outside the building and not re-entering the lobby and kind of congregating within that lobby. I think it's important to also understand that from a resident perspective that the stairwell handrails in the stairwells are typically not cleaned. Um, you know, I imagine uh, every couple of months we go through and dust and make sure it's uh, respectable. But those are touch points that are probably not in your cleaning protocols. So I think that's really important. So that's fire. The next one is leaks, floods and leaks. Water damage is a major costly factor uh, with regards to emergency preparedness in your building. So we need to take a look at our emergency suite entry procedures for number one. For number two, it is a great time to review with staff where those shutoff valves are and where the branch line isolation valves are. For example, we interviewed 10 condominiums just yesterday, and we found that both of those 10 are operating, 25% of their staff are new. That means one or two security guards out of their eight hour shifts or their 24 hour shifts are new guards. So those new guards have been working for about 12 hours this week, and they may or may not be aware of those isolation valves and where those shutoff valves are. So if we can shut down those valves three to four minutes faster than any other building, a blown sprinkler head releases 190 liters per minute. That's every 60 seconds. So there's a lot of new risks and a lot of new uh, liabilities that represent from the COVID-19 power failures. We have an increased risk of fire during power failures because we have more family members within the building 24 hours a day. And the use of candles are very real to, to, for emergency lighting. So, again, take a look at your normal routine of emergency management and make the tweaks and necessary adjustments based on those risks and liabilities. The uh, city of Ottawa, Ottawa police just announced that 70 per, uh, break and enters in their communities in this one community in Ottawa has increased 70% in the last four weeks. So again, risks and liabilities have increased based on the situation COVID-19 has been put us into. And I think that's really important. One more final point on that, Rod, is consider the new risks and exposures regarding staff training. So under the Ontario Fire Code, Section 2.8, all of our building staff are required to be trained on the fire safety plan before being assigned roles and responsibilities. How are we getting training to the security guards and the replacement superintendents before they take roles and responsibilities? Let's remember, your security concierge is operating all of your life safety systems at two in the morning in your building. That includes the emergency voice communication system, how to shut down the HVAC system, how to manually start the generator, how are we adjusting our training programs required by law? These are essential services, so they're still required. How are we managing some of those things? Okay, a question I often hear, and I'm not sure if you can, uh, sorry, I'm gonna spring it on you. If there's gonna be an evacuation uh, or a fire alarm, uh, to what extent must we ensure social distancing? And, and is it up to the corporation to provide, uh, I don't know, gloves or masks? Or how do you tackle this? Yeah, there's no gloves or masks being, that should be provided. Uh, I, I think that's a step that takes it a little bit far. But I think what we need to do as a corporation is just with what we're doing for our family of employees. We need to communicate to the residents, number one, that there are new considerations within the fire safety plan, such as social distancing once I leave my suite, social distancing once I get into the stairwell, and then social distancing once I get out of the building. I think that's critical, and it's not only a, um, a liability, you have a, a requirement under the fire code 
to explain those new risks within your fire safety plan. I'm not suggesting you have to update and review your fire safety plan, but I am suggesting that the Cotto Corporation is required to update the residents of these new requirements during an evacuation. Right. And of course, you have to communicate this ahead of time. Uh, there's no point in communicating it as it happens, right? So that's it. Uh, I think I think we've covered every uh, topic that we had on the agenda here. And so I'm going to do like I always do. I'm going to do a one last round table, uh, thanking you and seeing if you have anything else you want to add. And then also I'm going to talk about next week's uh, webinar, which, by the way, we're going to go back to the Wednesday window. Um, we did two Tuesdays in a row, and that was mainly because of the uh, to accommodate the Holy Weeks and the various celebrations, religious celebrations. But we're going to go back to Wednesday. But let let me go around the table uh, and start with you, uh, Sandy Foles from uh, Wilson Blanchard Management. Um, anything else to add before we part? No, just back to the old uh, stay home unless you're an essential service. Uh, we need to protect our vulnerable population and we all want to get back to a new normal, whatever that may be as soon as possible. Thanks so much, uh, Catherine Gao uh, on behalf of ACMO, parting words. Well, they say that it takes three times and three different presentations in order for folks to really absorb and understand information. So avail yourselves if you're a property manager um, if you are somebody who's responsible for communications, there are lots of resources from um, Public Health Agency of Canada, your municipality, there are lots of infographics, there are now some videos, share them and share them frequently. Um, one of my favorites and as far out, so the outside most piece of, of your property is a traffic light type sim symbol in terms of, you know, yes, maybe, no. And it'll be good reminders for everybody coming onto your property as to what they should be doing from a, a physical distancing perspective and whether or not they're visiting or only providing essential services. Okay, amazing. Thank you, Catherine. Denise Lash from Lash Condo Law. Uh, words of wisdom. Well, uh, you know, we're all in this together. Uh, I think board should remember that communication is really key here, that residents need to feel that the board is keeping the common areas safe. They need to keep their notices clear and consistent and help ease some of the anxiety that many of the residents are feeling right now. Okay, thanks so much, Denise. Uh, Graham McPherson, Gowling WLG. Yeah, so uh, I, I guess I'll just take this opportunity to thank everybody for tuning in. And uh, I'll just echo what's been said, you know, keep up the good work, keep uh, doing what you can to stay informed, keep pressing elevator buttons with keys and keep social distancing. Okay, David Plotkin from uh, Gowling WLG. Your turn, thank you so uh, much, David. Yeah, why, why should I change my, my last minute thought? It's always been every week, be reasonable. So I'm just gonna add that to be reasonable and be open-minded to alternatives. I know we, a lot of us are, uh, are kind of stuck in, in, in what we're used to and we're all having to adapt to a new reality. Um, so while you know the alternative to this meeting or alternative to uh, payments uh, according to this schedule might be a little different than it normally is, we all just have to go with the flow and uh, be as um, open-minded and flexible as we can in the circumstances. Thanks so much, David. Thank you, uh, Jason Reed from the National Life Safety Group. Anything to add before we go? Listen, thanks for having me. I think Richard Branson uh, put this very eloquently last week. Every success story is a tale of constant adapt uh, adaption and revision and change. Uh, and it sounds like the industry's uh, staying abreast and doing that on a day-to-day -day basis. So well done, everybody, and keep up the good work. Thanks so much. Christian Kedzieu, thank you so much, especially at uh, on very short notice for joining us. Any uh, parting words? Yeah, just uh, stay safe and don't touch your face. That's okay, very good. Thanks so much. And so there it is, folks. Uh, the next week's webinar, as I said, is on Wednesday, April 22nd. It's at 5 p.m. Information will be posted on the Condo Advisor. You will need to register again. You can register by ex accessing our blog using the webinar tab at the top. We encourage you to uh, send us questions and topics that you want to have covered, things that um, you need some help with. Uh, that's how we build our webinar. So the earlier you send it, don't send me your question 45 minutes before the webinar. By then, I have lined up all my speakers. So think about it. Send us your questions. Um, we will 
be posting the PowerPoint slides on the webinar tab again, and we will also be posting some of the resources that some of our speakers have referred to. Um, for instance, a screening questionnaire for, for um, your contractors. So we're gonna be uh, posting some of that. And if some of you are generous enough that you want us to share your stuff, by all means, send it our way and we'll, we'll see what we can do and we'll consider it. So that's it for me. I thank you very, very much for having attended once more. Uh, a lot of you uh, stayed on the line till the very end. So thank you very, very much. Uh, be safe, be healthy, be happy, be good to one another and see, see you next week. Thanks so much. Take care, everybody.